Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's Explore Classroom Hangout. My name is Joe Grabowski from National Geographic, and I will be your host for today. Really excited to be joined by our explorer, Emma Camp, who's joining us live from Sydney, Australia. But before we meet here, we're going to take a little minute and we're going to take a look at National Geographic's MapMaker Interactive. We're going to take a look at some of the locations where classrooms are joining us today. And we're also going to take a look at some of the cool places Emma gets to to work around the world. So bear with me for one moment while I share my screen. There we go. And we should see the map now. So I am here in Alora, Ontario, which is in Canada. And as I back out of this map, we're gonna get a little feel for where our classrooms are joining us. So they're gonna start to come into focus. We've got a class joining us in Thornhill, Ontario today. If we back out a little more, you can see Sarnia, Ontario. We'll continue backing out. There's Smith Falls near Ottawa, Ontario. And if we continue this, we'll see we've got classrooms in New Jersey, in Virginia, in Arkansas, and Louisiana joining us today. And if we back out a little bit more, we can start to see some of Emma's field sites. So here's the Cayman Islands. And if we move across the ocean, we'll pass over to the Seychelles off the coast of Africa. And we'll continue moving Indonesia and then a few places in Australia, the Great Barrier Reef, as well as Torres Strait. And then right down here, this X is Emma joining us here in Sydney. All right, so let's get that screen share off. So if anyone's been following along the last week or so, uh, we've been taking a really in-depth look um, at corals. We're looking at the beauty, why they're so important, we're also really looking at what's happening to them around the world, the threats they're facing from things like overfishing and climate change. And then of course, we're talking to the conservationists and the scientists who are working hard to try and figure out what we can do uh, to protect coral. So Emma Camp. Emma is a National Geographic Explorer. She's a researcher at the University of Technology in Sydney as well as the recipient of the British Ecological Society's Aquatic Early Careers Research Award. She studies and advocates for the world's marine life under threat from climate and environmental change, and her research focuses on the role marginal reef environments can play in understanding the impacts of future climate change. In 2017, she led the first National Geographic uh, Watt Foundation and Expedition to search for hotspots of coral resiliency, and she's also currently a member of the United Nations Young Leaders for Sustainable Development Goals. So Emma, thank you so much for joining us. I know it's very late uh, your time, so we really appreciate uh, you being up for us and sharing some of your research and expeditions around the world. Great. All right, Is uh, can everyone see me? Hi, everyone. <laughs> yep, yep, give me a wave. Great, lovely to see you all. And um, yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, thanks for the introduction, Joe. So, um, as you mentioned, I'm um, a marine biologist. I'm currently based in Sydney and I'm in one of our labs at the moment. So I'll show you a little bit more um, about some of what we're doing um, later on. But to begin with, I thought I'd tell you a bit about myself and then um, what I'm interested in studying, um, why I'm so interested in corals and the importance that they play um, for people and diversity around the world. Um, and then some of the threats um, that they're facing. And then I look forward to taking some questions from your classrooms um, after that. So my passion um, is to study corals that live in unexpected places. So unexpected because corals typically have a very narrow range of conditions where they like to live. And to understand why that is, we need to kind of understand a bit about what a coral is. So um, I like to think of a coral as uh, a factory in a way. Um, the corals are actually animals, um, but they also have a symbiotic algae. So these um, tiny algae that live inside um, the corals that give them their color, but they're also super important because they actually are able to photosynthesize and, and give the corals um, energy and, and, and molecules that they need. And there's also different like bacteria and fungi and all of these things that together form a coral. And the coral then is actually able to form um, a calcium carbonate structure, um, so like a skeleton which forms the reef. So for example, here in Australia, we have the Great Barrier Reef. 
And that is a living biological structure. It's the only biological structure that can be seen from space. And that's amazing when you think that that's made up of individual corals like I've got here. So I've got some skeletons to show you guys. So this is an example of a, of a disc coral and that's its skeleton. Hopefully you guys can see that. And we have different types of corals, okay? So this is, this is a solitary coral. Then there's also corals that are more like a boulder coral, a massive coral, like this. And then branching corals, like that. So collectively, these corals are what form that reef structure, which is really important for lots of reasons. And the reef structure is important because it's home to things like fish, um, macro uh, organisms, so things like sharks, and all, all of them together form a healthy uh, reef ecosystem. Um, but not only are they important for the um, marine life that live there, but lots of other reasons as well. So actually, a lot of um, pharmaceuticals and drug compounds can actually come from corals um, on the reef. Um, also, uh, storm protection. So reefs are really important to protect the coastline from incoming waves. And um, they're really important in terms of food security because over 25% sort of, of all fish in the world at some point spend their life on a reef environment. So they're crucially important for all of these, this, these different services. But unfortunately, as you may well have heard and, and seen online, reefs are, are under threat globally. Um, and a lot of that's actually to do with human impact. So things like local uh, impacts, things like pollution and um, overfishing, these happen on a local scale. But then on a global scale, we've got climate change happening and that's really um, severely impacting reefs for two reasons. And so hopefully I can share my screen. Let's have a look. Um, let's just see, bear with me. Share my screen. Okay. Can you see my screen okay? We've got it, nice and full screen. Yeah, okay. So if you look here, you can see these are two images of a reef um, taken this year on the Great Barrier Reef. On the left, we can see a really healthy, bright, vibrant coral reef. That's what we, you know, that's the reef that we want. Unfortunately, if you look to the right, that's a completely dead reef, um, and that's occurred through coral bleaching. So um, repeatedly over the last few years, um, the seawater's been getting warmer, and as that's happening, it's putting um, pressure on the reefs because the algae that I spoke about before that live with the coral, which are really important, when it gets too warm, those algae leave the coral, and we say that the corals bleach, and the coral then struggles to get the food and all and, uh, compounds that it needs and eventually can, can die. So just to put in context how much it's been warming, this is a um, sort of a time lapse to show over the last 100 years how much um, the oceans have been warming around the world. So as you see more of the reds and oranges, that's showing a 1 to 1.5 degree increase um, in the mean temperatures of the ocean and surface of the land globally. So what we can see is that from a hundred years ago the, the oceans and and the land have got a lot a lot warmer. And as we can see in this image here, the corals when they get too warm um, lose their, their algae. So on the left we can see the really white coral that, that no longer has its algae and, and if it doesn't keep those those algae will struggle to survive. And then we see the one on the right that has its algae and is healthy and is what, what we want to move forward. And so um, I think Joe showed one of the study sites from the Seychelles where I've worked. This is an image showing three years. So 2015, a healthy coral reef. By 2016, they'd all bleached, so the algae had left that coral. Um, by 2017, that reef, that reef had, uh, had completely, completely died. So hopefully by now, and you guys can see me again. You're back. Yeah, I'm back, great. So, so, as, so as researchers, we're trying to understand how we can help corals survive these changes that are occurring. So obviously global climate change is, is happening at a global scale. We need to reduce carbon emissions because the carbon emissions are what's being absorbed into the ocean, causing the ocean to warm up. 
and causing the algae to dissociate from, from the coral host. The other big problem that the corals face, I showed you before these skeletons, okay? These are calcium carbonates. You can think of these basically like, like the same um, material as chalk, basically, um, limestone. And if, um, if, they become, if the seawater becomes acidic or more acidic, it actually starts to dissolve. Um, and it becomes harder for the corals to build their structure. So the other problem that corals are facing globally is actually the, the absorption of carbon dioxide by seawater is making it harder for corals to build their calcium carbonate structure. So this structure here starts to, it starts to dissolve. It becomes harder um, for the corals to form their skeletons. So what do we do? Um, we've heard recently, I think in the last week, there's been a, a big report that we have to reduce temperatures by 1.5 degrees if we want to have reefs into the future. Um, but what I'm interested as a scientist is, are there populations of corals that naturally exist um, in very warm or very acidic waters like we're predicting under climate change? So through National Geographic and, and other funders, I've been able to go around the globe to explore reef habitats to see if there are corals living in unexpected places. And one of those locations has been in really murky, um, not very nice areas that um, are adjacent to mangroves. Now, mangroves are really important because they house lots of fish, particularly juvenile fish. They are again really important for um, protection of land. But actually we found when we go into a lot of mangrove systems, you can find corals living within those lagoons. And just naturally the waters there are very hot, very acidic, and actually also have um, low oxygen. And these are the three stresses that we're predicting to see and we are seeing with climate change. So what I do in my lab here and also in the field is to go around and say, okay, if I study those corals, so if I look at the genetics of those corals and the physiology, so basically how that coral is performing, can I start to understand how corals will need to adapt to survive into the future? And perhaps we can use that information to better manage the reefs that we have. So that's really where my sort of research is focused. So to show you a little bit of what's going on behind me. So in our lab, we, we do a lot of work in the field and I'm going to show you some pictures um, shortly from the field. But what, what we have in the lab is that we actually take um, very small fragments of corals and we put them on basically on little cement pile them up in here so we can then use them um, under different sort of extra individual coral polyps that are being grown up and if we move over here now they're a little bit dark at the moment because as uh, I think it was mentioned it's actually midnight in Sydney so the corals also have a have a night time but um you can see sort of some more hopefully of them again being grown up in here and so what we'll do with these corals is we've got corals from different environments and we'll stress them. So we'll take those corals and we'll change in the lab. So we'll make them hot, we'll make them acidic, and we'll see if the corals from these extreme mangrove systems are better able to deal with that stress. So can we enhance the tolerance of these corals by selecting them from, from different locations? And if we go back, hopefully I'm going to go back and share my screen with you now. Hold on. Um, just okay, bear with me. So, all right. So, the type of research that I've done has um, been termed by some people as, as super corals. Um, and the reason for that is, as we mentioned, that corals sort of globally are struggling. Um, with all of these, all of these uh, stresses, but but there are just some corals that seem to to laugh at all of this stress and be able to tolerate it. And so, um, while super corals may be not not the best term for it, it's it's this enhanced tolerance that, as a researcher, I'm really interested in in trying um, to understand. And so, this picture here shows you some of the types of corals that I'm interested in. So these are all within uh, mangrove lagoons. In the in the far left, you've probably can see um, the mangrove roots sticking out in the back. 
Um, and so these are the corals that are living in those really um, extreme um, conditions. So when we get to these sites, um, we, we have no idea what we're going to find. And that's what's really exciting about being an explorer. You know, in this day and age, there's not many places left um, on Earth that are unexplored. But because a lot of these mangrove systems have just not really been considered important, few people, if any, have actually looked in them. So these are actually some pictures from um, my National Geographic expedition. Um, and we turned up at these sites and it was very exciting. There were sharks and crocodiles and um, jellyfish and yeah, lots of things to contend with. But, um, but we, we sort of picked our study sites and then we just had no idea if we would even find corals living in these systems. So we looked around um, and then once we did find um, corals, we uh, first of all wanted to measure sort of what were the conditions. So what was the temperature of these systems? What was the pH? Um, and then how many different kind of coral species were there? So a lot of what I do would be involving scuba diving um, and snorkeling to see uh, yeah, what's going on um, within these systems. And then we take samples and we bring them back to the lab. So I've showed you um, some pictures from our wet lab and we have really sophisticated um, molecular labs here. So that allows us to extract the DNA of these corals and determine um, if there are certain genes, for example, that are changing. So that's um, what the genetic coding of, of that coral is. Um, and also if there's unique algae, for example, so I, I mentioned before that the algae are really important for the coral um, maybe they can associate with different types. So we want to understand um, which, which type of algae live um, with these corals. And um, I'll come back to this in a minute. So I'm just going to go back to myself. Um, am I back? You are back. Yep. Yes, cool, great. Um, so I still think I've got about five minutes. Yes, two, three minutes. Yeah. So um, before sort of I, I finish up, um, I wanted to um, tell you sort of where the, the research is heading next and then just share some sort of fun facts about some of the some of the places um, that I've, I've researched that. So where we, what we've learned, I guess, so far is that by exploring these really extreme systems, we found that there is about 30 to 50 coral species um, across study sites that are able to live in these extreme systems. So that's positive and it's negative. It's positive that we found some corals that are able to survive in these really, really hostile conditions. Um, but it's it's also negative in the fact that if we consider something like the Great Barrier Reef, there's over 600 species. So there's obviously a lot of corals that will be lost when these conditions become that extreme. We've also seen when we look in these systems, exactly as we're predicting under ocean acidification, we're seeing that the skeletons and that like um, of the corals start to dissolve. So we're seeing very different structures. So actually, when you look at these corals, you can see very clear we call them septa um, that form um, the, the structures of the coral. But if you look in these mangrove systems, they are very um, like they're a lot less distinct and look a lot more um, dissolved than they do on the main reef. So we're learning that there's definitely costs with living under extreme conditions. And the question and, and really the concern will be whether or not corals can keep pace with the amount um, of stresses that, that are going on. So the key for reefs. To, to survive into the future is really for us to, to manage climate change and really cut down on our carbon emissions to help reefs um, to have a chance into the future. So I'm just going to end by going back by sharing my screen quickly. So last time. So I wanted to end by just giving, I guess, a bit of an insight of some of the sort of fun facts about, I guess, some of the work that I do and being a marine biologist and, and some of the things that you don't always see. So these are just some examples of uh, accommodation that I've had during my field work. Um, so I have uh, slept in a shipping container for three weeks. Um, I have slept on um, on uh, houses on, on stilts um, that are about three, uh, three days from um, the mainland in Indonesia. Um, I set up labs in a bathroom. So this uh, on the left was actually on a on a super yacht that was donated to us for a research trip, and I had to turn 
um, a marble bathroom into a lab and it, it was um it was a challenge but it was it was fun and um, the back of ships will often turn into a lab so we have to be really versatile um, and that's half the fun i guess of, of the research and what we do um and then i guess i wanted to end on on this slide was just that um as a you know as a young female um scientist it, you know it was a great honor this year to be um uh recognized by the united nations for my efforts um, in in preserving marine life uh, particularly coral reefs and and just to demonstrate that anybody can have their voice heard you know i never expected to be in a position where i would be able to have my voice heard uh, at the united nations with um, the government leaders uh, of, of the world but i found myself in that position so for all of you listening um in your classrooms today you know dream big we all can and change the world if we if we choose to and we put our mind to it so i'm going to stop sharing my screen and i think hopefully you guys have got some questions for me all right thank you for uh sharing with us a little bit of your work what it's like in the field looks like some pretty fun conditions um and really thanks for sharing a little bit about what's happening with corals because i think especially a lot of landlocked classrooms might not know a lot about their importance and and just yeah. what is happening around the world and it's pretty interesting research you're doing finding those corals that that are resisting climate change are able to adapt a little quicker so i guess it's some good news that some coral will resist but hopefully we can we can do something yeah to, to help the other coral yeah exactly all right well let's meet some of our classrooms so let's Let's start off in New Jersey. Let's go to Mrs. Hockenow's class, grade seven students joining us. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing? Good, good, good. Wow. Good. Good, good, good. 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 So my name is Jana, and my question is, can coral bleaching be reversed? Was that can coral bleaching be reversed? Okay, so that's um, that's a really a really good question. So when a coral bleaches, um, it's not it's not dead at that moment in time. So it can be reversed in that if the water or the stress um, is is um, mitigated quickly, then the algae can return to the coral, um, and the coral can then persist um, into the future. But there's a very narrow window for that to occur and, and often unfortunately um the water stays for example warm for several weeks and during that period the coral ends up dying because it doesn't have um the algae return um, and and then it basically is starving and it's not able to persist so in answer to your question yes it can be re reversed but in a very in a very short period and more often than not unfortunately um it, it doesn't all right, great question to get us started, and we'll swing back to New Jersey after. Uh, okay. All right, we couldn't hear you for a minute, Joe. No, we lost. I didn't touch anything. Oh, oh. There we go. Oh. Oh. It all right, so we're jumping to Virginia with Mr. Audia's class. Uh, Who's asking first? Um, one of your research projects was the impact of scuba divers on the coral reefs. What were your conclusions to this study? Great question, and uh, yeah, good, good, uh, good researching skills of your own. So that was actually one of my very first um, research projects down in Florida. And I was studying, yeah, as you said, the impact that scuba divers um, were having on the reefs. And what I found was that actually in areas like Key Largo in Florida, where lots of divers are in um, a very narrow um, area of the reef, there's um, a big impact so that, that divers actually touch and kick and um, have loose equipment that, that damages the, the corals a lot. But the positive finding from that study was that actually if, if um, the boat captain or a staff member on the boat actually said to the divers before they got into the water, a little conservation briefing, reminding them that the corals were alive 
that um, that we should protect them, that we mustn't touch them, um, and that even kicking like sand over them is, is not good for them, that actually it, it reduced significantly the impact that divers had. So the take-home message was that, that boat captains and staff members should remind divers to, to be good divers to the reef. All right, they did their homework. They did. <laughs> Let's visit Mrs. Ford's class. They're joining us, grade sixes from Thornhill, Ontario. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing, grade six? How does a coral impact humans? How does a coral impact humans? Is that is that the question? Yes. So it's hard to say how it impacts humans but i think the the benefit that the corals have are there's lots of different benefits and it, i guess it depends where you are in in the world so for example in australia for example we have um there's like aboriginal people from um, australia who have culturally relied on the reefs and it's a really important part of their heritage for you know for as long as uh, this, um you know the reefs really been around so they they really uh, fundamentally rely on the reef culturally but as i mentioned before actually a lot of uh, pharmaceuticals so in drugs and medicine um come from coral so that's um important for us and then um fish or protein so i'm sure a lot of people here like to eat fish um in in the classroom and um, they'll they uh, uh, sort of rely on um a reef habitat and then also again as i mentioned uh, coastal protection so again for anybody living along the edge um of a coastline with a coral reef that really protects and um, protects sort of their their borders and you're also you know very aesthetically pretty and a lot of people obviously like to go there on holidays as well so there yeah lots of reasons all right uh, uh act as nurseries too don't they for a lot of species yes. of fish that start their life there before moving out yes. into the open ocean so they're pretty yes. darn important. They are. All right. Well, let's take a look here. Let's go to Mrs. Salisbury's class in Sarnia, Ontario, grade four or fives. Let me turn right. the microphone on. How are we doing, four or fives? Hi. 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 Cool. Great question, and um, I was hoping someone would ask that because I didn't. I didn't say too much about what what we can do. So, lots of things that um, that we can do, even if you don't live um, sort of by the ocean. So, the biggest thing is anything that we can do to reduce our carbon footprint. So, by that I mean if you cannot take the car and you can walk or go somewhere by bike, then that's helping the coral reefs because it's reducing the impact that it's having. Um, another big one is things like plastic. So if you cannot have a plastic straw or you cannot use a plastic bag or any of those things that are, are pollutants that often end up in the water, um, that would be good. And um, yeah, find out ways as well if you can get involved. So if you're ever at the coast and you can do like a cleanup or um, visit any researchers um, and see if you can help out and they'll tell you more about it. So lots of different ways um, to, to get involved. All right, and I think one of the easiest ones to add too is just to go home and talk to your friends and parents about what you learned about corals because yes. you can be a teacher, which is pretty awesome. And then the yes. more people that know and understand the problem, the bigger impact you can have. Yeah, definitely. All right. Our other live classroom, Mrs. Baker's group, is joining us in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. They're grade six students. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing, grade sixes? Oh, I think they're there. Let's try that again. There we go. Grade sixes, can you hear us? Hmm. I see them. I know. Give me a big wave if you can hear us. Grade six in Louisiana. <laughs> there. All right. I think they're. They might... What is the most challenging part? Okay. 
I think your internet slowed down a little, but I think your question was, what's the most challenging part about your research? Good question. The most challenging part about my research? Hmm. I think the most challenging part is to get the balance in communicating what we do. Okay, so I'm trying to communicate the and, and sort of study some of the corals that maybe um, give us, buy us some time with climate change. So I'm trying to find corals that have got some res resilience. But ultimately, if we don't reduce carbon emissions, then then what the research I'm doing, you know, won't won't sort of um, be of any benefit anyway. So it's getting for me the biggest challenge. I think is is balancing um, communicating the need to reduce carbon emissions, um, but also that we need to be doing this research and trying to find these tough corals to to help um, make it through. I think the other the other challenge from a practical standpoint is that a lot, especially here in Australia, a lot of the mangrove um, systems are some of the I guess most hostile environments to work in. So we have um, big saltwater crocodiles, we have tiny box jellyfish, um, blue ring octopus, um, quite a lot of sharks that, because um, it's murky, are quite difficult to see. So um, that can be quite challenging to work in. And so I'm having to use things like ROVs and drones to, to try to do my research. So it makes it a bit more challenging from a practical standpoint. Right. Oh. Great questions, and we're going to revisit our classrooms. But before we right. do, I have a quick question about the mangroves that you work in. Yes. So you hear a lot the mangrove environments are under threat. Um, they're being destructed. People are building resorts, and 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 other reasons they're being cleared. So are these resilient species of coral pretty dependent on those mangroves? Do they go hand in hand? Yeah, so what, yeah, exactly. And that's such a really good, a really good point to make. So first of all, not every mangrove we like go to have these um, extreme corals. But what we found is that mangroves that have these like channels that go through them um, create due to their um, sort of biology, they, they change the water chemistry into have being more acidic. And then they hold the water in these channels, which warms them up for these corals to then um, be living in these extreme conditions that then sort of makes them more tolerant. So exactly, if we lose those mangrove systems, then we lose the capacity to have corals be enhanced as well. So again, it's just as important um, that we're, we're conserving these mangrove systems as well. All right, so swing back to New Jersey. Let me turn the microphone back on for our grade sevens and go ahead. Hi, my name is Alyssa and I heard in 2017 you led the first National Geographic White Foundation expedition. What was your favorite part about that journey? Okay. Um, the, my favorite part about the journey was just the complete unknown of, of, of what we were going to find. Um, you know, I just, we, I like, it was, it's hard to kind of convey what it was like, but we would turn up um, to an island, for example, and you would see the mangrove channels often, um, like sort of going deep inside to this island. And sometimes we'd have to carry the boat sort of over like a coral like ridge, a dead coral ridge, to get into this lagoon. Um, and we just had no idea if we were going to find corals, and even if we did find them, if they were going to be extreme. And so, just being, you know, thinking that we know probably more about space than we do, you know, about some of these systems and especially more about about space than we know about the deep ocean. Um, it's just very exciting and a real privilege to sign up explore places for the first time. So for me, that was the absolute highlight. And, and then actually finding sites that had um, these extreme corals and, you know, being the first person to document them on the Great Barrier Reef was just yeah, really exciting and hoping to, to get back up and do some more exploring soon. All right, that sounds pretty amazing. I love that you brought up that point uh, yeah. about space and our oceans. Is you, know, you often hear that there's not much left to explore or discover, but I think that couldn't be further from the truth. And especially yeah. in our oceans, we have so much left to figure out and learn and discover and new species and relationships yeah. and a really exciting time to go into ocean studies. Yeah, no, definitely. All right, uh, let's go back to Mr. Audia's class in Virginia. Your microphone's on. I know that you, start, you said, stated that family is 
studying the oceans. Uh, what have to, only been through? You're going to talk louder and slower. Yeah, come a little closer for us. Move up closer and talk slower. On your website, you stated that your family, that your that family adventures piqued your interest in studying the oceans. What types of adventures did your family go on? Did you hear that? Still didn't quite catch it. It's a bit of a delay as well. I'm sorry. I think I got it. It was um, okay. on your website. It said that events and visiting places with your family kind of kickstarted your your love for the ocean. Can you yeah. tell some of those events? That was yeah. It. I Okay, cool. That's, yeah, and um, great, great, and um, great question. So, um, I guess for those of you as well that are, are maybe um, sort of in obviously landlocked states and um, not necessarily sort of by the ocean. I grew up in um, Essex, England. So, um, although there is a coastline, there's definitely not a coral reef, and I spent most of my time um, in, in a city, uh, basically. And um, when I was about, it's about seven years old, um, my family went on holiday uh, actually to the Bahamas and I remember it like it was like yesterday and um, my dad took me snorkeling and I, I had this mask and I like put my head under the water and I just remember it being so young but absolutely just blown away by what was under the water that you just had no idea was there from from the surface and then um, yeah from that moment i just was fascinated by sort of all of the life and the colors and the complexity that was that was under the ocean and then so sort of as i got a bit older and i realized how many people relied on that and then as i got a bit older still i realized sort of how um how threatened and endangered they were and 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 now sort of realizing that um you know within in, within my lifetime like they could potentially be lost that's sort of been my big motivation to to remember the seven-year-old me and 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 you know wanting to make sure that the next generation and the next generation of seven-year-olds have that opportunity to go out with their families and experience that beauty that i was able to experience all right great question a lot of these classes have done their research they know a lot about <laughs> Uh, Mrs. Salisbury, your microphone is on. How are specific species dying off of a result of the conditions in the coral reef? How specific, I'm oh, sorry, missed the second bit. How specific? Are specific species dying off as a result of the conditions in the coral reef? Other okay. than coral reef, yeah. Yeah, so so there are definitely so in terms of the the corals there are definitely some species that are um more severely impacted particularly by coral bleaching so often the branching corals so the ones that have a form like this just tend to because of their life history they tend to be um more vulnerable um to bleaching that isn't always the case so um, our last trip, we found actually a really tolerant branching species that, that survived sort of the uh, two years of really severe bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef. But there are definitely certain species that are that are more susceptible and um, are, are being lost. And and that's part of again what we still don't really understand is why some some species are so um, sort of resilient and some are so um, severely impacted but but we know sort of increasingly that things like the algae that they live with or if they have um sort of micro refugia so maybe another coral is protecting it um or shading it from a radiance which can in, uh, make bleaching worse can make a big difference so yes definitely some some corals are sort of being worsely impacted and dying off than others and that's the fear that some species could go extinct um, sooner rather than later all right to mrs ford's class again your microphone is on okay. how many types of coral are there cool okay so good questions it depends whereabouts in the in the world that you are um, so in the Caribbean, um, there's approximately um, about 40 species, give or take. Um, whereas when you come over into the Indo-Pacific, you're looking at more like six, 700 species. So and um, just because of sort of the his, uh, history of the different regions, um, there's different, different diversities. And what's particularly interesting about, say, around the coast of the US, so around Florida and in, into the Caribbean, 
is there's only two and then a hybrid species of branching corals, whereas in the Indo-Pacific there's hundreds. So and there's very sort of different different sort of um, diversity depending on where you are. All right, so we'll take right. one to Louisiana. Let's turn on uh, Mrs. Baker's class. Great. So, how long have you been working with National Geographic? How long? Yep. Yeah. So I was um I was actually awarded the grant um uh, last year. So my funding um so I guess um, this is sort of moving into the second year. Um so relatively new, but it's been um, really exciting because that's what obviously allowed me to do this first sort of exploration um up onto the to the Great Barrier Reef. So hopefully um, it will continue into the future. All right. Well, as per usual, classrooms, thank you for all the great questions. Um, great to see that so many classrooms did their research beforehand. And it looks like you're learning a lot about coral reefs and the problems that they're facing. So that's that's always positive to see that uh, the message is getting out there. And Emma, yeah. first of all, thank you for staying up past midnight. And thank you no for all the research you do and being so open to sharing it with uh, our yeah. students today. No, no worries. Thank you all for, for joining in. And yeah, you know, um, like uh, Joe said, please spread the word about, you know, the, the how awesome reefs are, how, you know, they are threatened, but there's still time to save them. So spread that message and um, yeah, just tell at least one person today something you've learned about reefs. All right, so I'm going to turn the microphones on classrooms. It's your chance to get nice and loud and say goodbye and thank you to Emma. So here we go. Microphones are coming on. All right. All right. Again, everybody, thanks for hanging out. Lots more coral reef hangouts coming up in the next few weeks, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks, everyone.